Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to uh, Open Source Intelligence, OSINT, Multigo, and Python. Um, yeah, I'm Chris Esther. I work uh, in the intersection of law and IT, and I've used Python since about uh, 2000. I've got one URL at the end, which has my slides with references. The slides that I'm presenting won't have any references, but they are um, heavily referenced. Right, I'm going to start off by defining what open source intelligence is and give some examples and uh, who's using it. <coughs> then going to look at some open source tools ranging from enterprise applications through to open source Python projects and uh, also look at some libraries that might be of use if you were rolling your own. Then going to focus on Multigo, which um, is an application I've been using. And I'm going to look at how, it can, how its functionality can be extended by the use of uh, Python, and in particular, a framework called Canary. And I'll do this um, in the context of uh, a trans transform or a set of transforms that I put together for interrogating the company office uh, registry. OK, to start off with, we need to define what open source intelligence is. This is, the, um, this is a US legal definition. Um, but really what open source intelligence is, is, the, um, is using uh, publicly, available, um, yeah, publicly available, legally available information, uh, ava legally available information to uh, a general member of the public, and um, analyzing that and creating some intelligence. And that means some actionable purpose. Uh, open source intelligence sounds kind of like open source software, uh, but not really. Um, there's no real relationship between the two. Uh, obviously, there are open source uh, software projects which um, can help in the, um, in the gathering and analysis of open source intelligence. And you could argue that open source code repositories uh, are a good source for open source um, intelligence but they're quite separate. So open source in, uh, intelligence, the inputs to the process are open, but the process and the outputs are generally very much not open. And uh, obviously with open source software, the, the inputs, the process, and the outputs are all open. In terms of citable examples of uh, open source intelligence, um, there's not a huge amount of people putting out what they, they have um, used it for. Uh, but some examples that I can cite, uh, the charming gentleman on the left and the, uh, the billboard refer to the Metropolitan Police's use of OSINT in London to combat um, racially motivated attacks and uh, the drug trade. Uh, in 2003, a, a military contractor providing OSINT to the US noticed some peculiar language um, in the way in which pneumonia cases were being reported in Hong Kong. And that turned out to be the, um, the outbreak of the SARS epidemic. And that um, reporting um, was credited in some part to uh, helping contain the spread of SARS. Um, the government, um, many government uh, departments, and I can't cite examples here, um, that use open source intelligence um, for making decisions about individuals and um, organizations and also in their planning. Um, surprisingly enough, reference librarians and uh, are the foot soldiers of, of OSINT in a lot of these cases uh, through the collection of the, the information that's being analyzed. And Syria um, currently obviously is a, it's a very messy situation up there. Uh, and OSINT techniques have been used to analyze um, some of the information coming out via Twitter and YouTube to create some really interesting um, uh, research. And the, the thing that you can see up on the top left, uh, sorry, top right there, is a command structure which was um, created just using the analysis of YouTube videos and Twitter feeds. Um, yeah, the, 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 it's a really interesting case study, and the, as I say, the um, the URL for that reference is in the uh, slides. So up until the um, 
the emergence and, and uh, wholesale use of the internet, most open source intelligence was um, through the analysis, the monitoring analysis of um, traditional media and broadcast. But obviously since the internet's taken off, uh, there's a huge focus on the, the digital information that's available. And it's quite, it spawned quite an industry in terms of companies that are uh, trying to help um, monitor it. And so that ranges from your traditional military contractors within the US to startups here in New Zealand. Um, so it's not really surprising that the, the, U, uh, the New Zealand Army was alerted to the fact of this particular tweet um, and they took action accordingly. In terms of uh, open source uh, process and some of the tools, uh, it starts off with a requirement. As I, as I mentioned, open source uh, intelligence is, is generally a, an actionable um, outcome so it needs to be defined, the requirement. Uh, the acquisition of, of data and information is the first step. There would be some um, processing of that, some triaging of it. Uh, analysis, visualization, and communication. Uh, you know, that's presented as a waterfall set of steps, but obviously that wouldn't be the case in, in real life. There'd be iteration going on between those steps. And in terms of analysis um, uh, by uh, tools, computer tools, um, named entity recognition to try and um, identify people and places from globs of text would, would be um, one thing. Uh, creating uh, network uh, graph diagrams with relationships between those things. Uh, sentiment analysis on the language as well. And um, machine translation between various um, human languages also. So I'm just going to... Uh, go through a few of the, um, the enterprise applications. I2 is um, sort of the, the incumbent in the space. And it's also worth noting that a lot of these providers do, um, the tools that they provide can be used for OSINT, but they're also used in all of the other forms of intelligence, so the, the covert forms of intelligence, and also just for general investigation purposes. So for instance, I2 is used um, quite a lot by the police, um, and I believe may be used um, in New Zealand for that purpose. Um, 35 out of the 50 countries deployed in Afghanistan used I2 products. Um, Palantir is a um, relative newcomer. They're founded and, fun founded and funded by PayPal alumni, uh, including Peter Thiel. Um, this screenshot shows their Torch product, which uh, analyzes social networks. And this particular example is showing um, some, some analysis that's being applied to um, the real-time Twitter fire hose. Um, somewhat controversial company in some aspects, it could be argued. Um, one of the issues that they got themselves into uh, was a copyright and trade secrets um, kerfuffle with i2, who sued them. Um, and that was uh, settled out of court. And the Winyard Group, this is a, a New Zealand company. They were spun out of uh, Jade Software. They've recently listed on the New Zealand Stock Exchange. And uh, in terms of customers, the Serious Fraud Office have uh, just purchased their software. Slightly more um, down to home in terms of the conference, this is uh, Recon NG. It's a Python product. As its name suggests, it's primarily a um, reconnaissance tool used for helping footprint um, uh, network uh, assets um, used by uh, InfoSec and pen testers. Um, it's similar in its structure and its usage to Metasploit, if you're familiar with that. The OSINT op spec tool is um, uh, a New Zealand um, created tool by um, Brendan Jameson. It was debuted at last year's KiwiCon. Um, and its purpose is really to, to monitor feeds for any instances of um, bad deeds or um, accidental leakages of uh, data. The back end is Python. Um, the front end is PHP, I believe. Spicy Mango is somewhat similar to um, the previous tool. 
um, it's being pushed as a, um, a tool for use within uh, internet uh, for intrusion detection. And again, it's, it's about monitoring uh, feeds, be they Twitter feeds, um, paste bin, and what have you, for, for examples of where uh, data is leaked or where there may be um, skullduggery afoot. If you were to roll your own um, tool for the sort of analysis, um, these are some suspects that may be very useful for, your, um, for that purpose. Um, starting off with requests for grabbing stuff over um, off the webs, uh, structuring it, LX, LXML and uh, Beautiful Soup could help you out there. Natural Toolkit for, um, for doing entity recognition and some other um, processing on text. Uh, SciPy could be of interest if you were wanting to do any um, uh, mathematical statistical stuff. And in terms of um, breaking the information down and uh, relating it in a, a, a graph or a, a network basis, NetworkX could be of use uh, and also for the visualization of that. So in between the enterprise applications and the uh, Python open source projects sits Multigo, a cross-platform Java application, and it's available in two editions. Uh, there's a community edition, which is included on a number of the InfoSec Linux distributions, such as uh, Backtrack and Kali. And the commercial edition starts uh, year one on a subscription basis of about 600 US dollars. Uh, and then it's $300 after that. Um, that sounds quite a lot, but when you compare that to the commercial products, which can start on a per seat basis of uh, 10K, uh, you can see it's not too bad. It's somewhat limited compared to the other applications. In fact, if we just go back to, say, the i2 one, uh, you'll see that you've got a, a network or a graph diagram showing entities, people, uh, and places, relationships between them, and then there's also a, um, a map showing um, some of those entities and where they are geographically. Um, these products also have um, heat map um, and time, timeline, such as the, the timeline down the bottom there on the Winyard group. In comparison, Multigo really just has the, um, the graph slash network view. Um, and yeah, it's all about entities, the, the links or the relationships between them and uh, what Multigo calls transforms. So here we have a domain, TVNZ, and then um, a transform has been, has been applied to that domain to find out all of the name servers that are available. They've been automatically placed onto the, the sheet and, and the relationships between those plotted. So it's fairly simple stuff. Um, the transforms, and, and you can also do that manually, just dragging um, these entities on, off a palette onto the sheet and drawing relationships yourself. Um, the transforms are just chunks of code, they're programs, so they, so they can be as simple or as complex as, as you like. Um, some, there's a lot of third party activity to um, hook up existing tools, um, such uh, as Metasploit. Uh, so you can run, so you could select one of those name servers and, and run some um, Metasploit uh, module against it. And uh, I'll just quickly show you what it looks like in action. Um, I've just videoed some of these because my, my PC, this video card is a bit screwed. So here we are, we're just selecting an entity, um, selecting a transform, that's going off, finding some information, we're running a transform on it. So in this case, getting some shareholding information. So it's, it's that simple. Um, and in this case, it's gonna show, gonna get the individual related to the um, directorship and it, it sees that they're both the same individual and, and joins it together. There we go, cool. So in terms of the um, transforms that come with Multigo, they fall into um, two c 
categories basically. One is data acquisition. So in this case, um, it shows again um, TVNZ domain. Um, and uh, a, a transformer has been applied to go off and get all of the hosts that can be found uh, via Google. Uh, the, the other type is um, a data analysis. There are less of these in Multigo. In this case, this is the KiwiCon, uh, URL for KiwiCon, and a named entity transform has gone off and uh, retrieved those. The majority of the transforms that uh, come with uh, Multigo are actually run, local, uh, run remotely on a, uh, a distribution server. And this is uh, like a discovery and uh, dispatch server. Um, so the code can run on a, there's one server and then it can pass it off to other servers. Um, they can also be run locally. Um, and in that case, they're just programs that uh, take stuff on standard and, and pass stuff out. Um, so in terms of what they take in, they take in uh, one entity, the transform does its thing, and it can emit either zero or more entities out the other end. So they can be different types. So you could take a person entity in it and you transform and um, emit a company entity uh, or a location and address. Uh, in terms of the, the transforms and extending things, basically you get a, a glob of uh, XML sent to you by standard in. You do your stuff and you pass a glob of uh, uh, response XML back out. There are um, a number of Python frameworks or, and, or libraries um, available for developing transforms for Multigo. Um, the Canary is probably the most um, actively developed and it has a bit of a community, more responsive to changes or upgrades in, in uh, Multigo. And that's the one that I've used. Uh, the TRX is one from the, um, the suppliers of um, Multigo. So in terms of creating a transform with uh, Canary, um, it provides a set of command line tools and uh, classes to help you. So um, you don't have to deal with the XML. The command line tools, are, some of them are quite similar to the tools for Django in that uh, you'll create a project um, using a, a command and then you'll create additional transforms using commands uh, similar to creating new apps with Django. So it, it populates uh, um, a project for you, makes things quite, quite simple really. And the, the classes it provides means that you don't have to deal with marshalling the XML, which is uh, something you really don't want to have to do if you can help it. And uh, finally, it has a, a, a command line tool which creates a, essentially a, um, a deployment bundle which you then import into Multigo to allow it to know what uh, additional transforms it has. So this is an example, a very simple example of um, defining an entity so if you are creating new entities, you need to obviously define them. And uh, this command is one class to set up a namespace. And then in this example, I'm creating a, a, an entity called company a, alias with um, just three attributes. And it's done by these decorators. So relatively straightforward. And this is the guts of a, um, a transform, essentially. I've left out a lot of the boilerplate code that surrounds this. Um, but in the configuration decorator there, you can see um, there's an, that uh, in the inputs array, that tuple there, it's, the first item is providing a namespace. And then the, um, the second um, is providing the entity on which it applies. So if, if there's a phrase um, entity on the sheet, you could, could right-click on that, and um, this transform would be available to you. Uh, in this case, the transform, it's, um, it's using a data access library, which has, has been imported elsewhere. And, um, and it's also using the uh, company alias, which we defined and has, has been imported further up the file. And so a very straightforward case of just uh, doing a search based on the, the request value, 
and then just iterating through and creating uh, entities and um, appending them to the response. The XML that you see, um, the attribute XML has got nothing to do with the transforms. That's, that's a domain specific lump of XML. So what led me here in the first place was um, I do some legal work around due diligence and um, some process work around anti-money laundering. And so um, the companies uh, investigating the structure and ownership of companies is of, um, of interest to me. Um, the limited liability company um, this is kind of a social contract. You get limited liability, but you have to actually disclose who owns the company and who are the directors of the company, and that information is publicly available. Uh, it's in New Zealand, we're quite lucky that we have um, that uh, available freely, and there is an API for that. Um, there is a SOAP and a um, what, sort of REST API they supply. Um, the API, uh, the REST API, requires a HMAC authentication, and I've put a, a small repository up to to deal with that, if that's of interest. So I'm going to give, hopefully, another quick demo to end on. And this, the demo I'm going to give um, is an example of just peering into a, a company. Um, so it's uh, a startup, a New Zealand startup called LearnCo, and um, I was interested to interested. Um, and who, uh, who they were, frankly. Uh, I'd seen mention of them in the newspaper and uh, wanted to discover more. Um, the About page provided no information, so um, I started using Multigo to dig into them. So this is really an example of the, of the transform that I put together. Um, but this could be used to um, you know, it could be used for, for doing um, anti-money laundering if you were doing business with this company and wanted to discover who was behind them, or doing due diligence if you were to, um, to want to uh, invest in them. So as you can see, when each entity is selected, you'll see different transforms being available. Um, so we're going to get the the directors first. And then the shareholders. The director the directorships are roles, so although they've got the people there, they're not actually the people, um, as you'll see in a second. So we're going to go off and get all of the individuals that are actually associated. So we can run all of the transforms in a particular set. And as you can also see, I mean, once, once a graph starts getting larger, you, ha you have to scroll out. So these are some of the people who are involved in the com uh, company. So you can see that uh, David Cameron, he's a director, and he's got a, a, a decent shareholding. So there's only one person, We've got a few other companies owning parts of this company. But um, one of the things that you discover when using the company's register is that data quality is not that flash. Um, and even in a, what you would assume the ability to provide the same names um, it's not always the case. So here we have Jeff and Jeffrey Dick, uh, Nixon, who are the same person. So we can merge those. Um, 
And at this point, we start just drilling, drilling sort of companies all the way down. Um, and it, Multigo provides a, um, a very simple macro language, and so this is what's being used now. So those other steps that we were taking, it's automated those, and it's just going to drill right down. And so what I thought was going to be quite a small startup company with maybe a couple of people involved, actually, because of the, um, the venture capital that they've obviously taken, turns out to be quite a complex structure. Um, and as you'll see eventually, um, we all own a piece of this company. <laughs> But, um, and I mean, other uses of this that I've talked with other people, all of these people, obviously, we've got their details. We could go off and do Google searches on them. Uh, we go and get their email addresses. If we were um, doing a pen test, we could then start doing spare phishing attacks on them. And so, yeah, there we are. We own a piece of them. So that's about it. It will continue going on. So um, I hope there's been something of interest there to you. Thank you.